Good morning, friends. Um, I want to bring to you today best practice uh, you know, of organizations in business strategy and HR. And I'd like you to meet my friend Rashida Sultan Ali. She is the head of human resources of a company called Leighton India, which is a multinational. And they're into construction in infrastructure and commercial projects. Some fairly large projects they're doing all over the country. They employ almost uh, 1,000 employees, and including labor. And um, they have uh, recently started evolving their learning and development function. And uh, so I'm going to give over to uh, Rashida. Rashida, would you like to say hi to the participants? So hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, Anita, for the opportunity to have a chat with your audience. Um, yes, so I'm, my name is Rashida Sultanali, as Anita said. I've, I've, I've just uh, joined uh, Leighton India Contractors uh, over this last year. It's been an interesting year as for every industry 2020, right? Because it's been the year of the pandemic. It's been the year of COVID. And from an HR strategy perspective, a lot of things have to be re-looked at and rethought of. Uh, in terms of how we're going to run training, development, uh, staff welfare, how do we address our you know, employees, how do we keep them connected in a world where you know, everything is uh, now talking about social distancing and uh, you know, uh, six feet dis distance, so to speak, and you're not in the office together to have those water cooler conversations or you know, coffee breaks and things like that. So how do we still uh, be effective, efficient, productive, and at the same time, you know, uh, bond and have those uh, relationships, which are uh, an outcome of spending, you know, time together as such. So it's been an interesting uh, year for me, to be honest. I also come from a different industry, right? So moving from the logistics industry to the construction industry has also been uh, quite interesting and uh, frankly, uh, a lot of fun for me on a personal level as well. <laughs> so Rashida, I can, I can see that uh, in your uh, organization, HR is involving and uh, I know you from many years and I know you're doing a lot of So could you say a few words uh, very briefly as to what is the general process by which learning and development strategy is designed by your organization? And how do you ensure that all the learning and development that you do is aligned to the business and organizational activities? So one, I, I, like I mentioned, I joined this organization in January this year. And one of the biggest lacunas in the organization was the lack of training and development. And uh, at a multiple level, right? I mean, at a level, at the labor level where, you know, you talk about how do you operate a train? How do you do rebar setting? How do you build a concrete pouring? You know, so right from the labor level to, you know, the the staff level where you're talking about how do you manage claims, what are time essentials, how do you do planning, how do you run a project, how do you meet the timelines, how do you, you know, make sure that the project is cost effective and we are not spending much more than we've agreed with the client, how it's how, how is it as per contract. So right from all of these things to, of course, then the whole overarching principle in terms of how do you run an organization? How do you run a project? What are the leadership skills, qualities, behaviors, competencies required to, to drive this behavior forward? So what we did in our learning strategy is we said, let's prioritize that everything is important, uh, but let's prioritize. And the things that we prioritize is essentially two things. Uh, from a functional level for the year 2020, uh, which is, uh, you know, how do you manage claims? Because as you can imagine, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a time of COVID and, you know, in a time where the force majeure uh, clause applies in all kinds of contracts, then our people who are dealing on the commercial side need to be very much clear about how to, you know, manage the claims that come through for the three to six months where the project has been inactive. So we focused on that, number one. We focused secondly from an organizational perspective also on the planning in terms of how do we meet timelines, how do we meet deadlines, how we reorganize our project so that you know 
uh, based on COVID, how do we, you know, have to have the extended the time? Uh, what is the impact of, uh, you know, uh, uh, the the force majeure clause and how do our costs and our billings be impacted by uh, this particular clause. So those are the few things that we kind of focused on for the year 2020. Uh, we couldn't obviously have a lot of training in quarter uh, two or quarter three, but we've started all our training now in the last part of quarter three and quarter four. And these are the things that we are focus, focusing on from an organizational priority uh, strategy perspective. For the year 2021, we will focus on... Uh, for the year 2021, we will focus on a lot of behavioral kind of things. Yeah, uh, yeah. Sorry, it's call coming in, so... Yeah, so we focus on a lot more behavioral and leadership kind of qualities and certain mandatory trainings around posh and so on. I mean, that's how we will define our learning strategy for 2021. So I understand that uh, your organization's main business strategy is growth in business in terms of acquisition of new projects and new businesses uh, within the country. So given the fact that you're looking at potential growth this year and next year and in the forthcoming future, uh, what are your plans to ramp up learning and development uh, and HR activities uh, to align with those business goals? So, I mean, we already have in the pipeline, we can see what the year 2021 is going to look like in terms of us winning projects. Uh, we operate in a very niche space in the construction business, right? We are not all over, uh, you know, uh, many different projects. We have very select clients whom we know who are high end, whom we know that we will get paid at the end of the project, for whom safety and quality is essential, and for whom timeliness is essential. And therefore, we also pitch ourselves a little bit higher on the higher end of the market because we we guarantee you know time safety quality all of these things so uh, that being said we know what's in our pipeline we are uh, therefore looking at our uh, learning and training to ensure that as we start to man all of these projects we make sure that we run all of these trainings as well uh, which I mentioned a little bit earlier, which are the functional trainings, which are absolutely critical to the effectiveness and the efficiency of our projects. And then we will build on them from a leadership and a management perspective. So I hear you saying that uh, you have uh, established as a business strategy, some kind of leadership in quality and in timely deliveriness, delivering, timely delivering of your projects. Right, right. So you want to be a leader in that domain. Yes, yes. The entire learning and development function is geared up to bring those skills on board. That we do. Correct, correct. Awesome. Yeah, yes. Great, wonderful. So can you briefly talk about what are some of the adjustments made to post-COVID scenario in your training effort? So I think the most, uh, I mean, the biggest adjustment made, uh, which I alluded to in the beginning was, you know, we don't have now face-to-face -face, uh, training, right? I mean, we used to talk about a learning strategy, which was 70% on the job, 20%, you know, you learn from your peers and 10% that you learn from a classroom training. Now, this whole 10% is where we've obviously made the adjustment where there is no, there are only virtual classrooms. So there are no classroom trainings as such, but there are virtual classrooms, which also means that we can actually have some of these trainings uh, much more frequently if we are doing a good job in terms of planning people's times, uh, time, you know. So there are, uh, and, and, and latent being uh, in the space that it is where health safety is quite uh, critical, then we have a lot of, uh, from, from our parent com company, which is the CIMIC group of companies, we have a lot of health safety, code of conduct, kinds of training, which are mandatory, and we have to refresh our learnings every quarter. So those are, if, you know, we are able to plan those in, we are able to plan our functional trainings, we book it in our calendar, and uh, 
you know, uh, uh, and we are able to effectively run it. I mean, we had a, a, some of these trainings, which I mentioned to you now, uh, we, we, we've done away with a lot of the hassle in terms of travel, coordinating times, people coming in, not being able to come in because the flight is canceled or bookings are not made and so on. And it's a virtual classroom where we can in fact have smaller batches even and maybe more frequent batches so that you are able to give individual attention to a lot of our you know, uh, participants. So you're scaling up uh, digital uh, training part. Di digital tech training. You're talking about the hard skills uh, required on the project, you know, like on the site, you know, the train and all the construction skills that you're talking about, which are so vital to the yes. quality and success uh, that you yes. talked about. Uh, so how do you deliver that online? So, I mean, there are a lot of presentations. So the methodology in terms of training, I mean, has to be expanded a little bit, right? Because now we talk about experiences. We talk about, uh, uh, we talk about, uh, you know, case studies. We talk about, you know, situations that could occur, which have occurred in some of our projects. How do we handle it? So we are using a different kind of uh, methodologies to bring home, you know, a lot of these things. And listen, having said that, you know, the digital, digital space and we have to expand on that, the fact remains that there is some value that comes out of sitting in a classroom together, you know, I mean, and there's no taking away from that. And, you know, once we start to try to lead, uh, roll out some of these uh, leadership trainings, where you use the methodology of role play and stuff like that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm still frankly, thinking a little bit about how we're going to run those because it does require to be sitting, you know, with the participants and having, you know, a little bit casual conversations even around how do you handle difficult situations, difficult conversations, you know, and those kind of things when you look at a skill building, right? But functional training, uh, you know, mandatory training, those are the ones which we earlier probably did in terms of classroom, which I can find very nicely can fit into the digital space. There are certain behavioral and competency building training, which I think we will still need to figure out what's the best way to run it, um, whether we have to do it digitally or whether we can, in fact, uh, three months, six months from now, actually have kind of classroom niche trainings, of obviously smaller groups, uh, than we did in the past, but still, you know, face to face. So, tell me one more last question, Rashida. How do you evaluate uh, how well you have uh, delivering business bottom lines? Yes. How do you evaluate that? So, uh, you know, uh, this is a question I think most organizations, frankly, uh, are still uh, struggling on because learning and training is such an intangible. Uh, kind of, a, you know, how do you how do you know where the person has built a competency, whether it comes out of those eight hours in a classroom or whether it's been because he went to the market and, you know, spoke to somebody and learned something from that person. Having said that, uh, in Leighton, it's, it's a little bit early for us to start evaluating training. Although we do, you know, we will, I mean, going forward, we will follow the Kirkpatrick module in terms of initial feedback and then after three months, six months and so on. Our, my, my comment is eventually is, uh, you know, depending on the skills and capabilities of our organization, how we are reducing the time between winning projects, that should be actually a strong indicator that our people are, you know, have the skills and ability whereby which we are able to build, uh, uh, we are able to win uh, projects uh, in the market. From my previous, previous experience where it was much more sales oriented, right? I mean, it is much easier to kind of look at a return on investment when you're training salespeople or, you know, people are involved in sales kinds of organization because then clearly you can see the GP increase and we can try and see how we are able to correlate it to our, 
you know, trainings around uh, neuro-linguistic training or, you know, sales uh, affirmation trainings or negotiation skills or presentation skills, then we are able to link it to the GP. So to be honest, I'm still trying to figure out other than, you know, winning projects, what are some of the indicators in this industry that I can uh, link the return on investment on? Okay, thank you so much, Rashida. I'm sure a lot of your uh, insights are going to be very valuable to our participants. Uh, these are participants of the ISTD, Indian Society for Training and Development. They have a postgraduate diploma in learning and development. And uh, they are all future training managers or already training managers uh, in large organizations and small. So I'm sure these lessons will be very valuable to them. And um, I look forward to uh, putting this into our next session with them. Thanks so much, Anita. Thanks. Thanks so much. Thank you.